Good afternoon. My name is Don Vibrat. Welcome to the uh, last of our series here as we go through. I need to move something here. Okay. Otherwise, I can't click on this button. Here we go. Okay. I, you would think after all of these sessions that I would have learned exactly where I need to be here, but I seem to be missing one. Okay. Um, it's your money, fall session. Uh, this time it's going to be It's Your Mind, Your Money and Your Mind, and a review of, of various issues that we've had along the way and topics. It does happen to be our eight, eighth week. So one thing I will say to you is, as we go through this, um, if you have questions and we don't cover them today, if you, send, if you give us a question and answer at the end of this, then we'd be happy to follow up with you. I would urge you, however, several of you are anonymous. It's very difficult to respond to anonymous because we don't know who you are. So know that if you're going to do that as we go forward, you may want to tell us who you are. Uh, okay, so process, obviously confirmation, we've gotten to this point, although we do actually have several people who just enrolled for this one. The material was, there's a link in the reminder you got today or yesterday, either one, that says materials at itsyourmoneyandestate.org. That's where the handout material that we'll talk about today is. That's where all of these various pieces are, including the recorded videos from all of the weeks. So we're current with all of the videos and it's the first video, the first link that you see for each of the weeks that will give you the video for that particular week. You cannot turn on your audio or your video because we are in a webinar environment. You, as we have said before, will use Q and A. Click on that button, tap your screen or something to wake it up. Uh, and that will allow you to ask questions as we go through. And I'm going to leave, at the end of this, I'm going to leave the series session up to allow you to ask some more questions at the end if necessary. We probably will not be able to respond to them at, at the end of the session, but that way we can get back to you and let you know. As we said, they are recorded and the handout material and the videos will be there probably through the spring. Um, I'm guessing they will not leave any sooner than that because we're not making any new ones between now and then. So that's where we stand. Here's the link. If you go to It's Your Estate and Money under the Materials tab, you see the various weeks and you can go either to Estate or Money. You didn't have to be enrolled in, in them. Anyone can go to them and get the information. There's also a tab off to the right-hand side for sponsors, for the various participating sponsors that we have. And we'll talk about them in just a minute. Today is It's Your Money in Your Mind. It is the last session for this one. Tomorrow we'll be doing case study and review for It's Your Estate, in case you wish to join us for that one. These are the physical locations that we typically have been at in the past and dearly hope that we're able to be at again. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to do something over here and I shouldn't do it. Uh, so these are the, the locations that we have and we dearly hope to see all of you in person in the spring because I think that's a lot better way to be. These are the participating charities and shout out to Chapman, who you're gonna see their video in just a minute. 10 years they've been a sponsor and we appreciate them and appreciate all the people who have signed up through Chapman uh, because that's been another group of folks that we have. So those are the participating charities that we have. And as I said, Chapman University, we had it in a state, we're gonna also have it in money. So I'm gonna show their video. David Moore and Lindsay will be on the video. And so we're going to switch over to do that. So let me do this and this and this. Hello, I'm David Moore. And I'm Lindsay Jacobs. We work for Chapman University, a proud sponsor of the It's Your Money and It's Your Estate series since 2010. One of the reasons that we sponsor the series is because we know the information is so good. The second part is that we really know that in order for people to be philanthropic, they need to have a good understanding of their own financial assets and where they stand long and short term both so that they can plan for the future. We would like to give you some insights into the university. We opened our doors on March 4th, 1861, the day that Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated as President of the United States. While our founders had actually approved plans approximately a year prior, they intentionally waited for the date of Lincoln's inauguration to make a clear and firm statement about their belief in equality. Chapman is still known for its commitment to equality and inclusion. We're also now considered one of the fastest rising stars in higher education. 
In 2019, we made an important move from regional universities ranking to national universities ranking in the US News and World Report Best College Rankings. And this put us alongside institutions like Harvard, Stanford, MIT, and Caltech. That same year, Chapman University achieved an important milestone as we were recognized with the R2 status in the Carnegie classification of institutions of higher education. That R2 status recognition is a confirmation of the research activity that's happening at Chapman University, as well as what's happening at the graduate and doctoral programs at the university and professional programs too. Additionally, our Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society membership confirms our deep commitment to the liberal arts. I like to share that our Ardro School of Business and Economics is the highest nationally ranked undergraduate business school in the state of California. Additionally, our Dodge College for Film and Media Arts is ranked number six in the nation. And we have many other nationally recognized programs in health sciences, economic science, computer sciences, film production, um, entrepreneurial studies, and so many more areas. Our faculty includes a Nobel Laureate in Economics, a National Medal of Science in Physics recipient, as well as Fulbright and MacArthur Fellows, and many Oscar and Emmy recipients. And last fall, we opened our School of Engineering in order to meet local, regional, and national shortages. With its Grand Challenges initiative, our Fowler School of Engineering is reinventing engineering education. Our students are tackling some of the most vexing challenges for our society from almost their very first day. In addition to our campus in Orange, we also have our graduate level Rinker Health Science Campus located in Irvine, California. That specialized campus is home to our Doctor of Physical Therapy, our School of Pharmacy program, our Physician's Assistant program, and many other programs that meet healthcare needs in the community. We open that campus not only because of the desires of our students, but because we understood the urgent need in the community to address healthcare. With an enrollment of nearly 10,000, Chapman University attracts students from around the world and provides them with an opportunity to dream big. We are blessed with wonderful friends and donors who support the university and become our advocates and create these opportunities for our students. As a graduate of the class of 2009, I know that my scholarships enabled me to attend Chapman, especially during my last two years in which we entered the Great Recession. I am forever grateful and deeply honored to be a living part of our generous Chapman family members' legacy. Today, our bright, deserving, talented students are facing an entirely new set of difficulties with COVID-19. And just like they did when I was an undergraduate student, our Chapman supporters have stepped up to keep the Chapman experience alive by ensuring that our students have scholarships and a safe and well-equipped campus for the future. Our supporters recognize that their generosity is an investment in the future through healthcare, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, business, entrepreneurship. There's so many ways that it really has an impact and this makes all the difference. And they appreciate that Chapman helps its graduates establish an ethical foundation on which they can build their lives and their careers as they become leaders in the global community. If you'd like to learn more about Chapman University and how you can make a meaningful difference for others, please let us know. We'd love to talk with you. Good afternoon. Hi, Pete. Hello, Don. Last hey. week of this such series. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we are happy. We are happy. Uh, <laughs> it has been great. It has been fun. But yes. uh, time to move on and be doing other things, as we say. Yeah. So a shout out to all the charities that have mm. been sponsors of our um, of our series. 
and um, and especially David and Lindsay. They're they're really besides um, uh, of uh, believing uh, the cause of Chapman. They're really really nice people, and um, they're they were if even if you don't include Chapman, they'll be happy to sit down with you and talk about your philanthropic needs or desires and run some gift illustrations. And Don is a philanthropic advisor as well. And so if you need a, a neutral third party just to uh, help you run some numbers, uh, you know, we honestly believe that giving is good and that if you give, you'll live longer. And that's a guarantee. So what I'm going to do is, because I, in the background, get to read the chats, the question and answers that you're sending to us, um, I will read those. And as I can feed them in and ask questions, or if I can answer as I go along, I will. Otherwise, Pete's got it, and I'm going to disappear. Well, bye, Don. Um, Carl, why don't you bring yourself up while I'll just kind of do a, our last kind of introduction and, um, and bring up your ask first form. OK. Uh, we've, uh, we're on our eighth week, um, so just want to just reemphasize the area of the need for doing a cash flow, net worth, how you spend your money uh, analysis. Um, we're all kind of reluctant to tell someone else how we spend our money. It's kind of a close to the vest. Uh, money is usually the number one reason for divorce. Many times upon when someone dies, families split up over the money. So we understand how sensitive money issues are. Uh, but you need to talk about those cash flows and we'll, we'll kind of do a review today as well as just talking to how your mind works when it comes to money matters. So let's introduce Carl. And Carl, you've got a bachelor's degree. And uh, did you go to school with uh, Mr. Obama? No. <laughs> yeah, we missed each other at Occidental College. He was there for a couple of years. Um, but I studied economics and math at Occidental. Okay. Uh, and later on, I got an MBA at UCLA. So it's the, really a great educational background to get into the financial services industry. You know, yes. You know, people don't realize that so much of it is number crunching. You know, what if this happens? What if that happens? And so that so your clients can kind of then make a decision as to what they want to do because nobody really can foretell the future. Right. Yeah. So your credentials, you're a certified financial planner. That's probably the most recognized designation for financial planning. Talk a little bit about uh, your practice, your firm. Well, Eclectic Associates was started back in 1984. So we've been around for 36 years in the same location in Fullerton here in Orange County. So when we started, there weren't too many firms like us, a fee only financial planning firm that was pretty rare, um, almost non-existent. Uh, today, it's more common, but still relatively rare in the financial industry, as far as firms that give financial advice, where there's a very transparent way that the advisors get paid. There's no commissions, there's no trailing fees, there's no payments from investment companies. Um, so we've always been a fee only financial planning firm since 1986. Since we're in the last session and people are now a little bit more familiar with the terminology, are you considered an active uh, of, uh, financial advisor or a passive or do you combine those two? Primarily, we use active managed managed mutual funds. Um, however, we see the uh, way that at times in certain portfolios where indexing uh, really makes sense. So I wouldn't say we're strictly active. Um, 
there are certain circumstances for certain clients where we do use more indexing. Okay, and then uh, you belonged, we, we haven't talked about this, but what is the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors? Well, this is an industry association that strictly is for those registered investment advisors like Eclectic that are fee only. So if you decide as you're thinking about the sort of advisors you wanna work with, that you specifically wanna work with one that's fee only in your area, the NAPFA website is a good place to go. Okay. And for our firm to be involved in NAPFA, at least two of our advisors have to be quote unquote registered with NAPFA because NAPFA has educational requirements that are double what a normal CFP needs. And so, how much do you have under management, Carl? We manage about $850 million for about 850 clients. And how many staff individuals or how many CFPs do you have uh, uh, um, in your group? We have eight advisors, so all eight are CFPs. Two of those have CFAs, or three of them have CFAs. That's a chartered financial analyst, so they have a lot more specifically in the investment realm. And then a couple of us also have MBAs. Okay, and uh, we're, you're, you're registered with the SEC. Want to remind everyone that whether you're registered with the SEC or just with FINRA, make sure you look up your advisor, whomever you're working with on broker check. Okay, it's very easy to do. And if you're a broker, you stay over on the FINRA side and if, um, if you're uh, not a broker, what I consider to be a financial advisor, you go to the SEC side. And the SEC stands for, what does it stand for, Carl? The Securities and Exchange Commission. Yes. And then, uh, and you provide for every client that you uh, meet with, and I think on an annual basis, an ADV form. Just briefly describe what that is. Well, the ADV is for advisors, and it used to be about an eight-page document, but then they simplified it. So now it's about 40 pages long. <laughs> um, they made us write in English. They made the whole industry start writing in English so people could understand it. So it goes into detail about the firm, how we get paid, what our individual experience is, um, information about um, our work experience, our education, all of that has to be kept up to date. And whenever there's a significant change or update, it has to go out to all clients. So an ADV form is kind of what an investment uh, prospectus is for an investment, it's full disclosure. It's, it's very complete disclosure. Uh, this year though, just in the last couple months, there's a new form called the CRS form I don't even remember what that stands for, but that's a new form that we also have to disclose. And if you go to our website, for instance, there's a link at the bottom of our pages to the CRS form. That's a new requirement. It asks questions that we have to then write answers to. Okay. Uh, let's get uh, right down to the basics. And uh, you're a fee only fiduciary advisor. And I think everybody now knows what that is, but how do you charge your clients and what also talk about whether or not your financial plan is included or do you charge separately and also talk about uh, whether or not you do uh, work on an hourly basis um we don't tend to do work on an hourly basis occasionally we do project work but the great great majority is ongoing contracts with clients um, our fee is calculated based on the investment accounts we manage, not other assets, but just the investment accounts. We add those up and charge 1% per year for the first million dollars. And then thereafter, as the portfolios grow, the fee drops. Um, there is a setup fee sometimes that's detailed when we meet with someone. Um, if you say that you uh, uh, found out about Eclectic Associates from It's Your Money, 
and tell me that in our initial meeting, I'll waive the setup fee of $2,000. Um, the you provide a first initial uh, consultation. Yes, for free. Happy okay. to meet with people, tell them about us, even answer questions. If you bring your statements with you and say, what is this thing that I'm invested in? I'm happy to explain it at that time. It's a it's it's really a great way to get a second opinion and to learn a little bit about what's going on in this industry is right. by taking your statements to a fee only advisor and having them review it. Yes, sure. I uh, is there anything else that I need to know about your firm that I haven't asked you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, we do a pretty good job of explaining it on our website. If somebody has additional questions, there are links on our website. If you want to set up a phone call with me, I also, um, if I can correctly use the sharing, um, I also included in my handouts a brief summary, a one page summary of our firm. It, uh, right. This topic today about um, our money and our mind is particularly good for me to speak on because it's it's built into the uh, mission of our firm. We think that it's our mission to help our clients achieve peace of mind about their money and their future. So this handout tells a little bit about the different things we do and summarizes it if they want to take a look at it. Super. And then you live in uh, Newport Beach. Your firm is in uh, Fullerton. And I think you've got two grown kids already. I do. Um, <laughs> our firm is in Fullerton. I actually, I'm on kind of the uh, prop, the line of Newport Beach. I'm not quite there. I'm in Costa Mesa, actually. Okay. Um, but I have a son in college back east and a daughter in high school. Okay. All righty. Let's get into your uh, uh, presentation. Okay. Well, here we go. Is it showing? I don't yep. know. Okay, good. I, yeah, I see it. Okay, very good. You've got a beautiful mountain and a stream. <laughs> so the, the idea that we can first talk about is, what do you think, Pete? Are we always rational when it comes to money? I don't think any of us are, you know? No, I, no we're not rational. In fact, we're just the opposite. We're irrational. Yeah. Um, at this point in this presentation, usually I'd show a Saturday Night Live skit with Steve Martin, who can't understand the difference between cash and credit. And it's a pretty funny video, but because of the webinar, we can't, we're going to disappoint people who have seen this presentation in the past. So yeah. we're not including the videos, but we'll talk about all of these crazy things we do. For instance, just the difference between cash and credit cards. If we use credit cards, the average person spends over a year 15% more than if they were forced to take cash out of their wallet and fork it over. Um, you know, we buy things on impulse. We say we need something when really it's just a want. Um, and then we assume things like, well, the stock market's been going up, so it's going to keep going up forever. But we know that's not going to happen. Or if it's going down, the world is coming to an end. It's just going to go down to zero. Well, all of those things are irrational. Uh, in fact, I just read this about kitchen remodels, and it shows kind of that everybody has an optimistic bias, and we're overconfident, and we believe that we're actually in control of things. So we tend to overestimate the benefits of something we spend money on, and we want, and we underestimate the costs. So the average person thinks that a kitchen remodel is going to cost about $18,500 on average. But on average, it really costs $39,000. We all get that wrong. And it's just an example of how we're really irrational when it comes to money. So and why? You know, are, you know what, Carl, once yes. you've done your kitchen, then Have you I do the rest of the house. <laughs> Our kitchen is pretty good. My wife would like it redone, but yeah. we haven't done it yet. So why are we irrational? Well, sometimes we just lack knowledge. We don't understand our investments very well. We don't understand some of these financial decisions. Um, sometimes we lack 
discipline. Um, we, we get distracted by what we want and need, and we are not disciplined, for instance, in saving money. But a lot of the time, it comes down to our brains. Our brains are wired to our investing disadvantage. And if we can spend some time thinking about and understanding that better, we will do a better job in the future on making good investment decisions. You, you know, one of the things too is, 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 is that what I find within families and with friends even, um, we really don't talk about money. So you can never, you don't hear, we talk about money in the media, but we don't talk about monies even within families. I, I remember growing up, I don't remember, the only thing I remember about the money was make sure you use a coupon when you go to a grocery store. Right. But that's it. Yes. So, it, it, you know, you, you have to learn this stuff on your own. Right. It, it's not passed on from family members very well. It's not taught very well. Um, sometimes yeah, there's supposed to be usually some sort of economics or money class in high schools and college. A lot of schools try to do that, but not so great. No, and you certainly don't want to talk about with friends and say, hey, you know, I've got a million dollars. What would you do with it? You right. got a million dollars? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, the, the time we talk about money at say a party is we talk about the one thing, our one investment out of 20 that did fantastic last year and gave us a story to tell. Or a hot tip. Yeah, sure, a hot tip, right. So are we good investors? Not so much. What about us makes investing difficult? So are we good investors? Let's think about that for a minute. And the answer is no. Um, and there are studies after studies. Here's an example of one comparing just index investing to the average investor. And when it comes to stocks or bonds or a 50-50 portfolio, in all cases, the average person does significantly worse in their portfolio than if they just invested in a simple index and ignored it. So the average investor tends to get an F. Another example of this is with actual dollars, showing if we started with 500,000 and we ignored it in a 50-50 portfolio, it would more than quadruple but the average investor does so much more. They miss out on over a million dollars of growth because they think they need to do things and they keep making changes in their investments. And this causes them to miss out on significant growth. Yeah. Another thing that happens is that they move in and out of their investments often at exactly the wrong time. And this shows that if they did nothing and just stayed in the S&P 500 index for this period of time, they would have turned $1,000 over the period of 1970 to 2013 into over $77,000. But if they missed the single best day, they'd only have 70,000. If they missed the five best days, they'd have 50,000 all the way down to the green, which is they've totally missed out. And that's what they'd have if they were just in T-bills. Mm -hmm. So missing out on just a few days significantly often decreases investment performance. That's one of the reasons why we say in the workshop series, do not make any changes. Because you, the, the hope is if you do make a change, it's the last change that you're going to make because it's going to cost you money and you got to understand what you're paying at the present time and what your performance may be. And then you got to look at what you're going to get into, what the cost is and what the performance may be and careful consideration on top of that. Then you make a change. Right. But that this, this, this slide shows exactly why not making a change is probably the best thing that you can do. Well, I don't know if you ever remember in the, actually you're old enough, you remember this, the Disneyland- I probably don't, Carl. <laughs> Disneyland had books of tickets. Yes. 
and there was an E ticket and an A ticket. And yes, so I do remember that. Well, Warren Buffett has often said he thinks at the beginning of someone's life, they should be given a ticket book with 25 tickets in it for their entire life. 25 tickets representing each one representing a big financial decision. And they only have 25 tickets for the rest of their life that they get to use. And that's it on big investment decisions. Now, I'm not talking about running to the store and buying groceries. I'm yeah. talking about buying a house. How much am I going to save? And if the average person was limited in how many big decisions they had to make, they'd make much, much better decisions. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to get into this later in the presentation, but everything is stacked against an individual to stay the same. And so, yeah, this guy, uh, I read that uh, when he was at, uh, I don't know if he still is at the University of Chicago, but the uh, fellow professors asked him how he invested his own money. Mm -hmm. And at the time when he was a professor, TIA Kreff was the only kind of opportunity that he had to get into a no load type of mutual fund. And he said, I invest in TIA Kreff and I diversify my investments and I never ever open up my envelope that I get from them. Yeah. And the reason so he goes, well, what, why didn't you open up the envelope? Then he says, because if I look at it, I more than likely want to make changes. Yeah, exactly. He's a funny guy. He's known for funny comments. And he talks about their economists and humans and humans think like humans, but his, all of his buddies in, in the economic world, they don't think like real humans. <laughs> um, but the main thing that his, he won the Nobel prize for was that humans are so impatient and inconsistent and distracted by these irrelevant factors. And you're illustrating it with your story about him and his investment statements in the mail. People open those statements and think they have to do something when really they should just be ignoring what happens month to month. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the uh, growing up I, or even today, uh, I will not, put cash in my pocket, because if I have cash in my pocket, I'll spend it. <laughs> well, sure, we all will. Yeah. <laughs> if you give me your cash to take care of, I'll put it in my pocket. Yeah, there you go. You. I'm not going to do that, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> so Nobel Prize winner, financial behavior is largely a problem of just self-control. So what about us makes investing difficult? Do you have any uh, specific answers for me, Pete, or should I just t talk go, about the go brain? Go right through it because this is fascinating uh, how our brain works. Right. So our brain, pretty incredible piece of uh, equipment that we carry around. And part of it is referred to as the uh, reptilian brain, perhaps, the brain stem. This is the part that um, controls our breathing. So we don't have to think about breathing. We don't have to think about our heart pumping. Um, the, the feeling brain, that's the limbic system. That's where our emotions and reactions come from. And then the thinking brain or the neocortex, that's all the brain matter, the gray matter around our brain that we primarily think of. That's where all of the thinking and problem solving happens. But a very specific part of the feeling brain is the amygdala. And buried in the middle of the brain, that's where emotions come from and it's what gets us in trouble. That part of our brain is where instincts come from, emotions, um, and then some of these other um, distractions to good investment decisions, that's where they come from. Like we think we need more information or we wanna take a shortcut. Um, it's also, because of the emotional center, it's how the, the media, uh, news, uh, magazines, the television, how it affects us, it often comes through the amygdala and our emotions. 
Yeah. Do you know what what what's really interesting? But you got your master's degree in business administration. I don't know what your emphasis was, but uh, finance. But if, well, in the marketing area, studies after studies try to figure out how to bypass your brain. Right. You know, it's kind of like when you go to the grocery store, uh, they pay extra to have the products at eye level so that it's it bypasses the thinking part of the brain and goes right into the amygdala, the instinctual part of your brain. Well, it's the boring food things that are way in the back of the grocery store, like eggs and milk. Everybody yeah. needs them, but they make you walk by the cookies to get to the eggs and the milk. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it's it's uh, but but politics, financial, uh, sales of products, it's all about getting to our instincts. Right. And and people often make investment decisions, unfortunately, from that gut instinct. Well, and, they believe that's more honest and right. intuitive and that's the real way to invest. Oh, yeah. But there's here's another PhD that points out that it's because those things happen so quickly that that instinct comes up. We think it must be true, but it, it's actually a terrible way to make an investment decision. It's a great way to get out of the street when a car is coming. It's a bad way to make a quick investment decision. Um, we have this instinct that we just need to act. And and that's a bad investment instinct to have. Um, it's actually usually mostly the opposite. That bias towards action gets us in trouble. So um, really, most of investing is making a handful of boring decisions and sticking with them for a very long time. It's you, exactly you know, the opposite of action. Yeah. I, one of the advantages of having a fee-only advisor is because your fee is related to the size of the investment account. And so you're on the same side, so to speak, as the client. And when the market goes down, one of the most advantageous thing that you guys do is try to calm down the client not to make a decision. Right, right. We try to check those emotions that get our clients in trouble because they want to act but we really, truly are on their side because we want to see their investments. We know they're going to go down at times. We want them to go back up because we want our fees to go back up. Yes. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's well, a, and, and you're not as emotionally involved in it's not your money, you know, I, uh, if it's your money, yeah, I, do you invest your own money the same way as your clients? Oh, absolutely. Because that gives you a discipline to how to manage your own money or? Well, if I really believe that I'm doing the right thing for my clients, then it only makes sense that I'm doing the same thing. So all of our employees invest our money in the same way as our clients. We actually, though, internally have double check a double check process. So every investment decision has to be approved by another advisor. So even in my account, another advisor sees the trades and has to approve them. And so it makes sure that we're, we're checking our emotions. Yeah, you're checking the emotions. It's amazing. But good, good system. So this is an example of the emotions that people go through. And too often, those emotions rule our decision making and you know when the market is going up we're excited we think it's great and eventually like now at all time highs in the market but then as it goes down we start getting anxious and fearful and then desperate and then we panic and and that's when we're making okay i've got to get out and it's exactly the wrong thing to do because when the market is down that's when there are opportunities. It's, it's kind of like uh, heights, altitude. When you're at a high height, it's dangerous because you could fall. It's the same sort of thing with the market. When the market is high, what is more likely that it's gonna keep going up forever 
or there's going to be a downturn. So it's actually a better time to invest when the market is down, when it's low, you have more opportunity. But that's exactly the opposite of the emotions we feel at that moment. And, and what you do during that period of time is, is this when you rebalance your client's portfolio based on their original asset allocation model? Uh, correct. Um, rebalancing happens on an ongoing basis and it's often something where a client just is sure that we have to do something today we will just default to rebalancing their portfolio, which all it means is that there are targets for how much you're supposed to be in these investments and they're out of whack and we just put them back into uh, alignment with those targets. So rebalancing, I'll talk about it later, okay. but it's a very common and it's the right thing to do. Um, so what do we do with these emotions? It's poor decision-making. So really what we need to do is not uh, do that impulsive action, but rather think about it, let some time pass, calm down before we make those decisions. Um, you know, it's interesting. We actually just hate embarrassment. And Dr. Thaler uh, points out that we even hate it more than losing money because in 96, he said, what investors fear more than losing money is having to say that I'm an idiot. And so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and you don't learn unless you become an idiot a few times you really need to start having some humility and explaining yeah. okay i don't know it all um and ultimately you'll make the money and you'll avoid the embarrassment so um um it's also interesting that different types of fear actually have the same physical effect in our body. So the fear of financial failure and the fear of physical harm, it has all of the same biological effects in our body. If we are fearful of losing money, we will sweat, we will lose sleep, we will, that fear has the same effect as if we were actually facing physical harm. You know, I, we've had, we've been doing the workshops for about 25 years now. And so we've gone through some real down periods. And I've literally have had people come up to me after the workshop and say, I cannot handle this. I cannot sleep. Uh, I'm not eating well. I've got to go back and put my money in a CD. Right. And sometimes it's true. We, we do have to talk to our clients about their investments and essentially use the quote, pillow test. Are they able to sleep at night with these investments? And sometimes our best recommendation is a little bit too aggressive for them, meaning it's bouncing around too much. They're not sleeping well. And so we will make it more conservative because they need to get their sleep. Yeah. And that volatility is what bothers them. So you lessen. That's why you adjust the portfolio as you're with your client over the years. Oh, yeah. It's, it's an ongoing process. We're getting to know our clients very well. And we need to pay attention to those things they say to us to adjust their investments accordingly. So the next thing we do is we think more information is better. Um, if we just do a little more research, if we just get another opinion, it's kind of analysis paralysis. And we get overwhelmed and then our, our brain kicks in and wants to take shortcuts. Um, because when we look at something like this graph, we really can't analyze it very well. There is too much going on and our brain looks for some way to make sense of that. Some people look at this and they see a graph where everything's going down and that's their shortcut. Other people look at this graph and see opportunity, things are looking better. And it's just their brain taking a mental shortcut. Well, again, the brain taking a mental shortcut is actually your body, your biology doing something. And that is 
because the brain takes so much energy to run. Actually, when you eat, a fourth of all the food you eat is powering your brain on a daily basis. A fourth of those calories your body uses to run your brain. So our bodies are always naturally looking for ways to conserve energy. And that means it's trying to help us think less. That's why we take these mental shortcuts. It's trying to help us to think less and save some of that energy for something else. You know, it's, uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned this. Uh, uh, I, I was with an individual that at, at one time, Merrill Lynch was touting uh, financial plans. And um, so, uh, they do these financial plans, never, the, the person who's doing the financial plan never meets with the client. They just send us information and they get these financial plans done somewhere back east. Now, I don't know if they'd still do it the same way, but it comes back into a binder that's almost 150 pages long, uh, leather bound in gold embossed with the name on it. And um, and I asked the individual, I says, have you gone through this? It's, a, it's just like that previous slide that you showed, but she treasured that saying oh, it that it looks fantastic. It, it looks must fantastic. Be right. It must be important. You yeah. know, uh, uh, they do the same thing in, um, uh, if somebody has a portfolio of bonds, and somebody asks a question, is this the correct bonds to be invested in? They send them like 50, 60 pages of information on that bond that nobody can understand or read, but it makes the person feel good that they have the information, uh, but they never take the time to really understand it. Right, right. Well, one of the ways we do a shortcut. Uh, Carl? So yes. are you are you telling me on that last slide, if I eat more, I'll think more? <laughs> I like this. This is a great concept. Eating and thinking. This is cool. Thank you. No, okay. That means if you're gaining weight, you're not thinking enough. <laughs> well, then I'll think more. I'll think about that, Pete. Thank you. So some quick examples on how we do these shortcuts is, you know, an example is called confirmation bias. We're looking for an answer and we're biased by what we think the answer is. So we'll do a Google search, for instance. And the first thing at the top, if it's what agrees with us, then we, oh, I'm right. And it, it confirms our bias. Another one is recency bias, which means that we take this shortcut thinking, whatever happened recently is going to keep happening. And so, if the last month the market went down, we, we are biased by that recent event and we think it's just gonna keep going down, even if we had great returns for the last three years. There's also a herding bias. This is kind of funny to think of, but it's kind of, we've, we see it in junior hires, right? Peer pressure. We wanna be in the group because it's a safe place. And so we have this bias it's called a herding bias, where we want to do and think what other people are thinking. Again, it's just a mental shortcut to help us make decisions. You know, the think of it, uh, Facebook with the uh, thumbs up. Yeah. What What are we, when you click on that, you're telling Facebook and whoever is analyzing things what your biases are. And sure. so they can literally now feed you information of similar individuals who have the same bias. Right. It's our, our brains are manipulated in unbelievable ways. Oh, sure. Yeah, the media is doing this just constantly, one way or another. Um, and they're very good at it because remember, they are all in the entertainment business whether it's a TV show or a sitcom or the news, everybody wants your eyeballs and attention and they want to keep it. So they're really in the entertainment business. So they sell things and especially the financial uh, 
news shows, they're selling things. So for instance, Jim Cramer, he's had a tagline for years. He uses it on his books, his television shows, his podcasts. He says, you know, you can't afford to miss my show. He's selling greed. He wants, it's entertainment, but he's selling it and appealing to our, our greed, our want to grow our money, to want more of what we have. The media also uses fear. So they use these terms. You can turn on any um, financial program when the market's doing something crazy and all of the commentators will start using these kind of exaggerated dramatic words. You know, the market is, it's a bloodbath on Wall Street. Um, the market is freaking out. Uh, this company is too big to fail as if we'll all go down with it if it fails. Uh, the stock market's crashing. It's always a crash. <laughs> it, it's just part of the fear. Um, Dr. Thaler points out that, you know, our, we overreact to all of this. Um, in one of his books, um, he wrote with a student, people tend to overreact to unexpected and dramatic news events. And that drives these stock prices out of whack. Um, right now, what did the market do yesterday? There was announcements about Pfizer vaccine trials having all of this success. The market kind of went bonkers yesterday, did cr some crazy things. Today, it's doing more. And it's all people overreacting to these news items on the fear or greed side. Um, you know, it's funny. We often think that these folks on television, they're on television because they're an expert. And an example on what Jim Cramer said in February of 2009, he thought that he came on after thinking about it all weekend, he was interviewed on Monday and he said, you know, investors really should sell their investments for any of the cash they need for the next five years. Well, guess what happened a month later in 2009? Kramer came on in February. He almost timed it perfectly on where the market bottomed. He told people to sell out at exactly the wrong time as the expert, telling them whatever you need for the next five years, you better sell those investments now. He got it exactly wrong. And we see this again and again in the media, in the financial news, but they don't do a very good job of telling us that or reporting on it. Oh, here's it's because it, it's because they don't look at an individual's risk tolerance. They don't look at an individual's goals and objectives. They don't look at their net worth, their cash flow needs. They're no. just looking at it as like an investment is just a product. It's an idea in isolation. Yeah. It's not related to the specifics of somebody's financial life. And in fact, most individuals will tell, well, if they ask me to name a professional, one of the first things they'll say is, well, how do they do on their investments? And right. I go, the investments is the apple rolling off the cart. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's, it's, it's all that other stuff that's more important for the advisor to know to figure out how to do a diversified portfolio. Right, right, right. Absolutely true. The, uh, here's some example on uh, Fortune Magazine getting things wrong. There's examples from Barron's, back to CNBC. Uh, you know, Jim Cramer in March 2008 said Bear Stearns was fine. Six days later, it went bankrupt. Then on CNBC, Power Lunch said Lehman Brothers was safe. Three months later, bankrupt. Um, Merrill Lynch, this was in 2008, 2008, 2009, when these companies got in trouble and they needed capital from the government. Merrill Lynch wasn't going to need any more cash. Sure enough, wrong. Five months later, it had to be bought by Bank of America to get out of all the trouble that it actually was in. And still owned by Bank of America today. Right, right. Well, you know, all of that stuff you're reading or hearing on the television from the financial news shows, remember, it's all free advice. And what's the value of free advice? 
you know, if you look to real experts, they usually charge you something. So do you recognize the man in this black and white picture? Yes, I do. It was taken back in probably 1960s. That's Warren Buffett. He gets asked all the time, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? If you really listen to him, he often kind of points you in the right direction and he gives you a principle, but he never gives you the actual advice that you really wanted to know. So a good uh, example of how much he charges for his advice is that every year he participates in a charity uh, auction. And every year he takes the wallet out of his pocket and he auctions it off. And in that wallet is one stock tip and you get to have lunch with him. And that wallet goes for anywhere from two to five million dollars every year because people want to meet with Warren Buffett and have lunch with him and discuss these things with him. And he gives them one true stock tip. And the lunch is at the Dairy Queen. <laughs> yeah, it was Dairy Queen or a, a, the, the fanciest steakhouse in Omaha, Nebraska, where they've got good beef in Omaha. But still, it's in the relative sense, it's not a super, super fancy restaurant. Well, he's the, he's the guy who basically said also that uh, the brokerage industry is the only profession that he is aware of that if you that can devalue the relationship that you have in other words you can lose money right he says if you go to a dentist you know you can kind of get your teeth cleaned you know or fixed and uh, if you go to a doctor you know you're going to get something a little better he says the brokerage industry I, uh, you pretty much can do this on your own with index funds if you want to. And uh, it, you got to really be careful whether or not that person is going to add value to the relationship. Right, right. It's, um, you know, we hire painters to paint our house and there are good paint jobs and bad paint jobs, but in almost in virtually every instance, it's always better than it was. But what you're saying is you could you can invest your money and with the wrong advice, you can end up with less. Well, because a broker doesn't can call themselves whatever they want. Their well, brokers true. are not, it's it, a broker is an in-between individual. They don't, a broker has, does not have fiduciary liability. They have suitability. So, and they're there to sell you on a particular product or an investment. Are you going to get into Goldman Sachs at all? Or that, um, I, I can't remember if you're going to talk about Goldman Sachs. They're considered the premier agency or the premier brokerage house, the kind of the gold standard. And they were fine almost 10 years ago, like $500 million because they didn't put their clients' interest first. Right. They were just brokering a limited partnership. Right. It's, uh, yeah, almost every year they make money. Well, the, the shocking thing of it was, is, is that when they paid the fine in the press release, they said $500 million would have no impact on their earnings. Right. Very, very financially secure and successful. Yes. Well, we've been talking a lot about these different things where the amygdala gets us in trouble. Um, we follow our instincts. We let emotions take over. We make some of these other mistakes. So let's move on. What do we need to do be better going forward as investors? Do you have any thoughts, Peter? Uh, but I'm going to let you do them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I've summarized these as six. By the way, I don't manage my own money because of this. Right. I, I let other individuals manage my money because of exactly because of the mind and the time. I don't desire to do this anymore. Right. Right. Well, there's six main things we have to do. The first one being, like we've learned, 
discipline is so important. So you need to follow a disciplined strategy. And this means that, you know, before the storm, before the market goes haywire, you need to think it through um, and write it down, preferably. We are all better at achieving goals that we write down and then stick with that plan at those times of high emotion. So for instance, at Eclectic, a new client comes in, we write the financial plan and have them review it. And in writing, we're saying what, our, what we're going to be doing for our clients and we're documenting their goals and we're saying how we're going to do it. And it helps all of us better in the storms, in the market fluctuations that we know are going to come. So we put it in writing. And, you know, Warren Buffett, again, he has said this, success in investing, it, it doesn't correlate with IQ, with big brains. You just need ordinary intelligence and then the temperament to control those urges, those emotions that get people in trouble. And if you write it down, that your helps. financial plan, it helps you with discipline. Um, Again, Dr. Thaler, investors hate losses more than they hate gains. They focus too much on the near term, even when it comes to long-term goals like retirement. The writing down of an investment plan, of a financial plan, helps us focus on the long-term. By the way, most sometimes I get from people who come to our workshops say, hey, I'm 75, 80 years old, uh, my time horizon is really short. And, uh, you know, I tend to disagree with that. I, I'm 70. The average age here on death in Orange County is 96. So long term, I would say is anything longer than five to 10 years, anything in the five to 10 year range. Right, right. So write it down. It helps you be disciplined. The next concept is to be diversified. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, here's an example. This crazy chart, it's hard to read, but the colors represent different types of investments. So there's a very dark blue box, for instance. Is the dark blue box at the top all of the time? No, each of these different years, it bounces around. So if you only invested in the dark blue investments, You'd be up, you'd be down year to year. If you're diversified though, and you invested across a lot of different types of investment like shown on this chart, you have a much better chance of doing pretty good in most years. You don't wanna put it all on red. You don't wanna play roulette with your investments. You wanna spread it out over different types of investments that will do well at different times. You know, one of the lessons I hope that people get from this eight weeks is to review their own portfolio to see how well diversified they are. Right. And sometimes it's not obvious. They think, well, I've got five different mutual funds. But if those mutual funds are all investing the same way, they might be all in the same investments. So it's you have to be careful and not assume that you're diversified. Yes. Uh, next, you need to pay attention to what was called allocation. And allocation is the mix of those different types of investments. So a conservative allocation probably is going to have lots of fixed income or bonds. A, an aggressive- when you, say, when you say conservative, does that mean less volatility? Yes, it goes hand in hand. Okay. It's not, it's not possible to have a conservative, well, you can think you have a conservative portfolio that could be bouncing all over the place. So there are some very volatile bonds like 30 year bonds. So not all bonds are created equal if you want a conservative portfolio. Okay. So this mix is a very important decision and I wouldn't want anybody to sh take this pie chart and copy it. It's just an example of the, what's called an allocation, a different part, a different percentage of your investments in different types of 
uh, investments. And allocation is a very important decision. It's often, many studies have uh, shown that it often explains about 90% of your performance. The mix of your investments explains over time about 90% of your return. So it's something you should spend time on, that allocation decision, a lot more time than the individual investments. So you could spend all your time on the allocation and then rather quickly use index funds to fill in what you're using for that allocation. Uh, the next thing to do is to rebalance your portfolio. We mentioned this, we have a bias towards action. Well, when you wanna act, if you're worried about your portfolio, just rebalance. And this is an illustration of that. A simple allocation would be 50% bonds and 50% stocks. And if stocks went down, now your bonds are a bigger part of your portfolio. So rebalancing would just be getting back to 50-50. If the market's going down and your bond side of your portfolio has gone up, in this case, from 50% bonds to 60%, well, then you just shave off some of those bonds, sell 10%, and turn around and put that to the stock market. Now that's not gonna be easy because stocks are what just went down. And so it's, it's going to be exactly the opposite maybe of what your amygdala is telling you to do, but it's exactly the right thing to do. And you'll agree with me if I put it a different way. And that is sell the things that are high and buy the things that are low. You're selling the bonds which are high and you're buying the stocks, which are low. It's, it's, it's a really interesting um, um, phenomenon because most people believe that it's tied to intelligence and these, some of these concepts. And so Conaham in his book uh, uh, stated that it's how we phrase things a lot of the time determines our actions. And they did an experiment with medical doctors and they said a particular drug had a 10% failure rate. And they took another group of doctors and said, this particular drug was 90% successful. And what they found after the study was the doctors that they said 90% successful were subscribing that particular drug 75 to 80% of the time. And the side that said it was the 10% was defective only 30% of the time. Right. Just on how it was phrased. Right. It's again, the bias, even amongst experts. Investment professionals, they have emotions too. They sometimes do exactly the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, next, um, costs matter. The fees you pay matter. And there's a couple examples here on how just a little bit difference in a fee can affect you if you're impacted by that difference over a long period of time. So in this case, um, you know, the difference between a 1% fee and a 2% fee is maybe over 30 years, a difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars in a big portfolio like this. Um, you can miss out. You might think, oh, it's a 2% fee instead of 1% fee. But over that period of time, you're missing out on something like 25% of the upside that you would have had because of those fees. One of the things this slide was used uh, by John Bogle in uh, a congressional hearing when there was a debate whether or not to use social security funds in the private marketplace. And the 3% is the average price that a brokerage client pays on an annual basis in their retirement fund in their 401k 
Right. And so look at the difference over a 30 year period from a 1% big, to you, Carl, 1% to year to an average client of a brokerage firm, 3%. Right. In, in just, this illustration. And, yeah. And it's the one thing you can control is fees. It's just that the brokerage industry makes it very difficult to figure out how much you're paying. Right. It's not transparent. Not those, at all. Those fees are taken out in the background. And most folks don't really notice that they're disappearing. But the 1% to 33% fee difference is like about 40% less on returns. Yeah, it's also kind of an oxymoron because in a sense is here, I'm paying more, so I should be getting, getting more results. Right, yeah. It's the total opposite. The less you pay, the better your performance is gonna be. Right, um, similar on taxes. It's just the question of being tax efficient uh, versus not. So use retirement accounts as much as possible, defer taxes, be tax efficient. Be tax uh, we help our, uh, yep. We help our That's clients right. with strategy. Yeah. Uh, it's just a the, the, the just a simple thing that it's try to get your capital gains payout versus ordinary income. Right. It's just a uh, tax harvesting towards the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, the qualified dividend on uh, on uh, dividends from stocks. Sure. It's, it's it, taxes are huge and and you can control them the uh we're all going to pay something yes um but it's the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance tax evasion you end up in jail yeah. tax avoidance is just pay the taxes you owe but don't pay any more than you need to yeah. just avoid taxes if you can and be tax efficient be tax wise right so finally um, accountability, having the right kind of advisor working with you, using Ask First, figuring out their education and experience, figuring out if they're licensed or not. This is an important decision and it helps you be disciplined. A good advisor will help you do that. In fact, Eclectic Associates, like I said, it's our mission to help our clients find peace of mind about their money and their future. We work with them, we work for them, we help them avoid those bad mistakes that can really impact them for years. And if you find a good advisor, it will be a form of accountability to help you reach your goals. Yeah. And, and remember, licenses are not designations. And the more licenses an individual has, the more you should have your B antenna up and your S antenna up because why would the person have all these licenses? Right, it, it's interesting. Licensing actually says the wrong thing usually in the financial world. James Bond is licensed to kill. All of these <laughs> brokers are licensed to sell you something. So. Yeah, it's not a designation. Right, so. These six areas, um, if you can concentrate on these, they'll help you a lot. That's what we've covered in uh, this, this chat. Thank you for letting me share these things with you. That wraps up my presentation. Carl? Yes. You mentioned a uh, million dollars, it was 1%. Do you accept people under a million? Oh, sure. That's just, um, we start quite a bit lower, but for the first million dollars that we manage, whether it's $100,000 or $900,000, our fee is 1% a year. The next, when you go past a million dollars on your total portfolio, then those additional dollars are charged a lower fee. So for most of our clients, they end up paying less than 1% on an average year because their portfolio has grown to the point where their fee get drops a little bit. You know, I, I noticed there's a question on, uh, on, on being a fiduciary in the financial wor world and as to what it means. And uh, 
uh, you know, from my point of view is, is that if a consumer is confused about what a fiduciary means, I think they're, they're in the ballpark because the financial services industry doesn't want you to know what a real fiduciary is. So how do you, how do you figure out uh, uh, whether or not your financial advisor is a fiduciary? Well, if they're licensed, they're definitely not as far as being a broker, because that's a license to sell and they're receiving a commission. So they can't also be a fiduciary. So check broker check. Exactly. If they're um, selling insurance, would you call that a, a fiduciary? No, they're not a fiduciary either because they're going to receive a commission when they sell you that life insurance. Now they could be a fantastic, wonderful person and give you good advice, but remember, they do want to sell you something at the end of the day. So they may give you good advice, but just be a little more suspect on why they're giving it to you. And, and the reason why that's important is, is that if they put you in a load fund, you can't change your mind after 30 days and say, I want my money back. You've already paid that sum. Whereas if you go to a fiduciary advisor and let's say, Carl, you know, I, after 30 days, I've met you a couple of times. I just don't care for you. What would you do after 30 days? Well, if it was exactly 30 days after we started working together, you probably haven't paid us anything yet because we were still working through the financial plan. Um, but we would give you your money back. Um, we Entirely. charge, we charge part of our fee over time. And if in any of those periods, you pay in advance for our work for the next four months. If two months later, you decide this isn't for me, we have to give you money back because we haven't earned it yet. But in our contract, it, it explains that we write the financial plan and after we've written it, if you're not satisfied, the contract is void. Um, if we've charged you anything, you would get it back. Um, but the way we tend to work is we write the financial plan. It usually takes a number of weeks. And then when it's approved, that's when we sign the paperwork for the accounts that we manage. And that's when the first bill gets sent. Okay. So it, it's yeah. very, it's yeah. very obvious and clear to our new clients how it works. Um, the other question that we have is, 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 is that the use of retirement accounts, uh, um, what do, should people maximize their, uh, uh, their retirement account, accounts first while their savings or if, uh, uh, the other question I have on retirement accounts is that should they be treated separately or should you do an asset allocation uh, with your retirement accounts and outside of your retirement accounts? It, uh, it does depend on the total financial situation, but usually retirements are long-term money. It's going to be years and years and years and this money is used. So the way it's invested is going to be for years in the future that allocation, those investments are probably going to be more aggressive, more slanted towards stocks. But if you need money, uh, say for a new car in the next six to 12 months, that's money that should be in cash now. You don't want fluctuating um, with the stock market because it's something that you're going to need to use it for in the near future. Um, an example of what you're asking is when we, do financial planning for our clients, we do not consider their home an investment because they want to live in that home and they don't want to buy and sell it if, it, if they get the right price. It's, it's too much of a hassle to move. They have roots in their community. Their kids are going to school. The house is not an investment in that way. So we kind of set it aside. It's an asset. It's something they own that is going up in value, but we don't consider it part of the investment portfolio. 
Do you guys do analysis for individuals, whether or not they should use a traditional IRA versus a Roth IRA, or should they change their, should they transfer some money from a traditional IRA over to the Roth? Is those kinds of analysis do you do for your clients? Absolutely. Um, in some cases, that makes sense, because if you move the money, if you convert those retirement dollars from a regular IRA into a Roth IRA, you're going to have to pay the taxes to make that happen. And once the money is in the Roth IRA, you're never going to be taxed on that money again. So it can be a great deal, but it depends. For some folks, it's not a good idea at the time in their life. So do you help clients determine whether or not to make gifts on an annual basis to their kids or grandchildren? Oh, sure. Um, and there are some good ways to do that and some not so good ways. Again, do you help, do you help people out when, when to take Social Security? Yes. Um, sometimes it makes sense with a husband and wife for them to take their secure, Social Security at different times. Um, because if you take your Social Security late at around 70, you'll get more every month. And so if you can afford to wait and you think you're going to have an average long life, that can really help you come out ahead. Or do you help individuals out whether or not they need a 529 plan? Or do you help individuals out to determine who can in the family might be best to serve as trustee uh, if they need a successor? Yes. So 529 accounts are a tax advantaged way to save for college. And we can run analysis and tell you based on your goals and where your kids will probably go to school, this is how much you need to put in that college account every month or every year. Yeah, um, and, and do you run analysis if people are fearful of running out of money? Do you kind of help them maybe even spend more? Well, sure. That's called a retirement projection as far as what we call it. And some people are very, very worried about running out of money. It's not unusual at all. And with a very conservative approach, 